Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to uh, this week's Geoscience Australia lecture. lecture. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is David Robinson. I'm the branch head for the Basin Systems branch here at Geoscience Australia. That's part of um, GA's senior executive team, and it is my pleasure to chair today's seminar. I'll begin with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri uh, people whose country we are delivering this seminar from today. I recognise that uh, many of you online are joining from uh, uh, the country of other First Nations people, both within Australia and overseas. And I'd also like to then pay my respects to the First Nations people uh, from where you're joining, but also across all of Australia's land and sea jurisdiction. Uh, Geoscience Australia's work extends across all of our jurisdiction, and we do so in partnership with First Nations people from around the country. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, their uh, support, but also their country, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today we have uh, two speakers. Uh, they will be talking about the offshore Otway Basin. So the first speaker is uh, Mary Ellen Gunning and I just invite them up to the stage while I introduce them. Mary Ellen Gunning, or M as we all know her, has an MBA and a Bachelor of Applied Science in Geology having studied at Melbourne Business School and RMIT University. She has over three decades of industry experience. Since joining Geoscience Australia in 2015, she has worked on a wide range of prospectivity and CCS projects and is currently director of our Offshore Energy Systems Directorate. Chris Nicholson graduated with a BSc in Honours in Geology from the Australian National University in, two, in 2000. He joined Geoscience Australia in 2004 as a basin analyst and structural geologist and has worked on, on or led a variety of regional prospectivity and CCS studies of Australia's offshore sedimentary basins. Chris is a member of PISA and CPEX and is a past president of the ACT branch of PISA. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Em, who will be the first speaker to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Em. Thanks for that introduction, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of Chris and myself, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose country we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So the work we're going to talk about today is aligned with the future gas strategy which was announced by the Australian Government a few weeks ago. Within that strategy it says gas will be an important fuel for the foreseeable and that it's an important element in our our journey to decarbonisation. The work's also strongly aligned with Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028, in particular the Building Australia's Resources Wealth Impact Area, and when you look at the things that, that reflect into the corporate plan about what we will do, um, it's mapping Australia's energy resources. So. The presentation today is in two parts. I'll give a brief introduction, but then the first part will be delivered by me, and that will be on the post-stack 3D merging of um, the post-stack 3D merging to fast-track regional interpretation. Uh, the second part will be given by Chris, and that is looking at some of the interpretation outputs from that that data and other data, and our understanding of the offshore Otway Basin. These presentations are based on those that were given last month at the Australian Energy Producers Conference in Perth. So just a bit of context for those who don't know the Otway Basin. It's an onshore offshore basin. It, um, get the pointer. There's a pointer. So it goes from the offshore South Australia all the way through the onshore South Australia through Victoria and then south into the deep water off Tasmania 
and back up to South Australia. So it's quite a large basin covering a number of jurisdictions. It's a producing basin, both in South Australia and in Victoria, and the, the gas that comes out of the offshore section in the shipwreck trough is a very important input into the East Coast gas market of Australia. The area we'll look at, the data I'm looking at is, is the shipwreck trough, which is circled here. And you can't really see the polygon within there, but when we get into the detail, you'll get a better idea of what um, we're talking about. In terms of age, the basin goes from latest Jurassic through to today, so it's quite an extensive depositional sequence. So, part one. This is what the interpreters face. So at the beginning, this is just in the shipwreck trough region. You've got King Island here, you've got Cape Otway here, you've got a whole heap of vintages of 2D data. Um, this, these lines through here were acquired in 2020. Prior to that, the line spacing here was about 100 kilometres. And so there's a lot of this basin that's underexplored. So if we strip out the 2D from that and look at try and make it a bit easier to, to deal with. Sorry, we've got multiple surveys, both 2D and 3D. Multiple versions of processing. So it's been processed and reprocessed and reprocessed. Um, and some of the data has been previously merged, both 2D and 3D. And as I say, the mapping project's predominantly a 2D mapping project. Um, so we're integrating um, interpretation across 2D and 3D focused on the Upper Cretaceous section. So that's the um, Sherbrooke super sequence, which you can see through here, and the Shipwreck super sequence through here. In colours here on the left, you can see all the different 3D surveys that we used to do this merge. And just here you can see the path of this arbitrary line here. So we strip out the 2D data and we're left with 3D data and it's still a bit of a blamange of data. Um, we didn't consider this survey over here because it's just a bit too far from the others, but it goes all the way from the onshore all the way down to Brant in the south and that water depth down here is about uh, 4,000 metres. So making that even more usable would be to have it as one big contiguous 3D um, and treat it like one survey uh, rather than the input surveys. So when this was given at AEP, we could work on the premise that everyone in the new room knew that a post-stack merge was inferior to a pre-stack merge, but that a pre-stack merge was not um, an option. Right? But some people in this room may not know that, so I'm just going to explain why pre-stack um, migration is a better alternative in terms of technical outputs and then explain why we did post-stack. So imagine you have the sea, this is the ocean surface and this is uh, the sea floor and this is a sedimentary event that occurred in the past that we're trying to image, that we're trying to understand. So focusing on just one point on that surface, the year is 1999 and the Western Pride is the vessel and it comes down to the Otway Basin to do the investigator survey. So it comes in, it's, here's the vessel, here's a cable. This cable is about eight kilometres long. It's got lots of hydrophones along its length. Hydrophones are just microphones, they're not, um, they measure the pressure wave. So the boat fires its, its guns, blows an air bubble. When that air bubble collapses, it sends energy down into the earth, straight down, focused right below it, and that reflects. So the wave goes down, refracts at the sea floor, hits our surface of interest, comes back up and refracts and gets measured at the farthest end of the cable. So this is the acquisition area. So we've got measurements all the way out to here. But when we stack the data to average that all out and move data 
from this area into this area, you can only migrate it so far. So we can migrate this point, but we can't migrate the points in here. All right. So in here is what we call the full fold area, and in the pale blue is just the acquisition fold. So time goes by, 2013, another vessel comes down, um, and it comes along and it wants to extend that survey out. So it shoots a new survey, different vessel, different cable, different air guns, um, fires the air guns, sends a signal down into the earth, that's measured. Um, we've still got the same point that we're trying to understand. That's the ray path from the source and the receiver. All right. So again, we can't migrate or move the points from out here into this volume. So there's your full fold area. All right. So combining those two things together, you've got a full fold version of Investigator and a full fold ver version of Astrolab, the neighbouring survey, half the cable length, and this area here is unmigrated. All right. So when, if you just stitch these two surveys together without doing migration in this window, at the edges you're going to see effects. And I'll give an example right at the end showing that effect. Right? But this is why in an ideal world you'd do a pre-stack or you'd re-migrate the data. Anyway, hopefully that wasn't too technical, but we'll get back to the proper presentation now. So why did we do a post-stack? Well, um, we are GA. Um, time is the primary factor as to why we did a post-stack. This had to be turned around in two months. Right? If you were to do pre-stack, that would be a year's work at least. Right? It takes more computers, it takes more people, and it takes more money. Um, but in this case, it was mostly time. had to be done by the end of the financial year. Right? And the objective was to create a volume that was useful to interpreters to improve the interpretation process. So we weren't looking at doing ABO analysis of, of gas uh, fields in this, in this project. We were just trying to make it easier for the interpreters. We had 12 input volumes at the end, over 14 surveys. Some of them have previously been merged and this is 8,000 square kilometres <coughs> of data, of 3D data. So these are the surveys. You can see in here, multiple survey names. That means they've previously been merged. Um, then you'll have other surveys like Brandt and Crowsfoot which hadn't been merged in the past. Um, you'll see that some surveys like Investigator for instance, there's four different versions of that survey in here. So our surveys range in the years that they were processed from 2000 to 2017. The way it had been migrated, those surveys had been migrated in the past was variable. Some were pre-stack time migrations, some were pre-stack depth migrations, um, and many different types of algorithm used in that migration. The angle ranges for the stacked volumes that we used as input varied greatly. And um, you can see these all together, these will add up to over 8,000 square k's of area. You can see the surveys here, the inputs over here in different colours. This orange survey in the middle is Investigator North. That's the survey that was chosen as the reference survey. It was chosen partly because of its position in the middle of the overall merge, but also for its data quality. So looking at that in cross-section, we have an arbitrary line through those volumes here. So it goes from the north down to the south. So this is Brandt in the south, that's deep water, and the orange one in the middle is our reference survey. And you can see even with this um, poor colour scale that there's a high variability in the quality of the data. It'll become more obvious when they're on the same colour bar. So looking at the processing sequence that we applied, I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I'll go through some of the main ones. The one of the first steps was regularization. And what that is, is that sort of like gridding the seismic data. So taking it in a 3D sense and putting it in a grid. So we chose 
Uh, this orientation here that you can see on the left, so in lines and cross lines, um, there's the input there after, re oh, after it's been regularised, um, so put on that common grid. This uh, orientation was chosen partly due to it generally went along structure, geological structure, but also because um, it minimised the re-binning of any existing data, which um, sped things up. We were looking to speed things up wherever we could along this project. So the next phase was um, mistie analysis. Basically, we treated this data as if it was 2D data and did um, a correlation between the surveys to assess how much they had to be shifted in time, phase and amplitude. So you see Investigator North here, it didn't change. Everything else was shifted relative to it. So the adjacent surveys were matched to that and then the further out surveys were matched in turn and in turn and in turn. So most of these are pretty good. You'll see the biggest is a 20 millisecond shift in Brandt. That's the one in the deep water. That was tied using a 2D line. So it um, didn't actually abut in 3D but it's still quite a good tie. Um, the window used to do the correlation was the water bottom, which is here, plus 250 milliseconds, all the way down to the water bottom, plus 2,500 milliseconds. Now that takes out the canyoning effect through here. And a lot of the windows we used to do the tying took out that canyoning effect. So that's the data after it's been um, undergone that missed tie analysis. The next step was spectral broadening. So now we switch to the frequency domain. Again, we defined three windows, water bottom to the top of the Sherbrooke. Now the 2D inter regional interpretation as it was at the date was used to inform this. So it defined where these windows were. So that all came from the interpretation team here. Then you've got the LC2 down here. That's the second window is the Sherbrooke super sequence and then from the LC2 down two seconds. So they were the windows used to do um, the spe spectral broadening. You can see here, the top graph is, it's very hard to see, but um, this is the spectrum before it had been broadened and this is afterwards. You can see there's two surveys, one up here, that's at the extreme, that's very noisy, a lot of high frequency noise in there, that's labella. You'll see a lot of the high frequency noise when we go through. And then down here, I don't know why, I don't know why, but um, this Minerva survey has um, very, has, seems to have, but had a bandpass filter applied to chop off any of the high frequencies. Might be just a rough noise removal. There is a lot of low, um, poor response in the low frequency here. That's the investigator survey, and that's multiple versions of the investigator. Not sure why, might be an acquisition problem. Can't, can't put back data that wasn't there in the first place. Anyway, so by and large, the merging is done at this point, right? But there's still things you can do to improve the data quality. And the first was to take another window approach to noise removal, and this helped with Vulbella and some of the others. So again, you take out the canyoning effect and look at this interval through here and assess um, and run some filters on it and remove a lot of the, the high frequency noise. Also lateral amplitude scaling. So you'll see as you move from left to right through here, there's sort of dull bits and then dark bits and dull bits and dark bits. You want that because that can reflect the actual stratigraphy. But in some cases, it's just a data effect. So we're trying to remove that data effect so we can correlate better across those larger regional distances. So we also did um, acquisition footprint attenuation. You won't see this in the, in the section because it's too fine, but when you look at it in slice, you can see that it's made a big difference to the quality of the data. And oh, and a residual gain. So that just boosts the amplitudes down here so that you can, um, the, the interpreter's eye has an easier job of it. Um, we weren't particularly concerned because of all the inputs and the previous processing. True amplitude wasn't really an option here um, to look at ABO effects and things like that. Um, so we just um, made it easier to see rather than um, crunch. 
Right, so this is, this is what we started with on the same colour bar. So this is what I showed you before with the different colours, except this time it's in a common colour bar. So middle survey here, this is our reference survey, the orange one. Um, you can see here, this is labella, very noisy, lots of shallow water multiples here. Um, not much we can do about that in a post-stack world, but it was in actually improved by taking a lot of the other noise out. And yet, yeah, very patchy. There's no way you would get an auto tracker to pick a meaningful event through here, um, even in a shallow event, let alone our area of interest, which is through here. So, and this is 140 kilometres long, by the way. And this is after. So I'll just go back and forth a bit so you can see the difference. So it's a lot easier to see. You can see even over a regional scale of 140 kilometres, you can see they correlate these sedimentary packages, um, particularly through that T1 to LC2, that Sherbrook super sequence um, interval, and, and DEMA. So just focusing on a few examples of uplift, we'll look at number A first, or A first. So this is here in the northern part. Um, this is the Crow's Foot survey. If you focus on these areas, We'll just have a comparison so you can see across these fault blocks and also this deeper data here. So this is it before and after. Before, after. Before, after. So you can see this fault block and this fault block, you can correlate that. Whereas before, you go, mm, yeah, I don't know. Um, the unconformities through here, the the downlaps here, it's all a lot clearer. The coherency of this event across that scale is much, much easier. So definitely easier to interpret the second one than it was the first one. So that's the areas that show up left. Second example, I don't like this example. So you're up here in, um, into Minerva and just focus on this fault area here and this shallow, shallower sequence here. So that's the output. Input, output, input, output. I'm sure you agree this fault is a lot easier to pick on the second one than it was on the first one. And this package here is also a lot easier to pick. Uh, third example. This, this is a remarkable example. So on the right here, we have labella, very noisy. Um, oh, yeah, we have labella, it's very noisy. And that almost looks like a data management issue rather than a correlation issue. Focus on those downlaps there and this sequence within um, labella. And afterwards, you can actually see that package extend through there and you can start to see some of these events, although there's still a lot of noise in there, um, you can start to see some of those events through there. So there you go. Uh, D, now this is our reference survey on the right, and this is um, labella on the left. You can see it's a bit bland through here. So just pay attention to that area and also that shallow unconformity. And you can see it's a lot, of, you can start to correlate across here where you couldn't before within that Sherbrooke super sequence and that unconformity is just, an auto picker will pick that unconformity now. It wouldn't do it before. Uh, and even in the deep water, we've got this example um, of, this is Brant, so as I said before, this was tied by, by a little piece of 2D um, between the surveys, but these, it looks very hard to correlate and um, so we're down here, just for your reference, and then focus on that package and you can correlate it after the fact. So you can actually see these units between the surveys now. You see this little window here, this little effect, artifact? 
that's because there's not enough data to migrate. That's what that migration effect is. So you would need to do a pre-stack um, data uh, migration to solve that issue. But we can't extend this to do that. So just quickly looking at it in um, time slice. So this is taking a horizontal plane through the volume. This is at 500 milliseconds. Um, I'll just point out some areas to focus on. That's the Flanagan join. So if you notice where that survey joins there, just compare as I go down through it before and after. The noise in Labella here and see the improvement in that. And also the con contiguous events that come through here. I mean, just compare it on that one compared to that. You can actually see the geology there. Right, I'm just gonna step through them. So this is 1000 milliseconds, same areas show improvement. I think you'll agree that the, it's a lot better on the, on the right than it is on the left. Uh, 1,500 milliseconds, 2,000 milliseconds. So even at depth, we're starting to see um, a lot of improvement in the data. In terms of um, what, this result, what this volume enables us to do. So having that one contiguous um, volume that, that can be used by the interpreters. It provides for more continuous tracking of events using both auto trackers and also just to the human eye. Um, waveform picking works. So I had a crack at that T1 surface and it was pretty easy and pretty quick and it stayed on track most of the time without having to fiddle around with the parameters too much. So you could, that's going to speed up interpretation. Right. You can produce normalised amplitude maps, extract seismic attributes, and this helps inform, what, inform quality control of seismic interpretation. It indicates things about depositional events that you can see in, in, the, in the seismic facies. So a lot more information to be extracted there. Um, structure. Uh, particularly in that time slice view, you're able to generate things like variance, which is going to highlight those faults. You're going to be able to pick those faults quicker and more accurately, um, and therefore build up your structural model um, across the survey. And as you see, correlating fault blocks between those surveys is now within the fault blocks across those surveys is a lot easier and any, you can also recognise any changes in, in structural trend more readily. And improvement, improved work processes. So just managing one volume versus 14 or more, right? Easier to load, easier to manage, easier to collaborate across um, and subdivide it by different people, um, break the workload down. So when should you do a post stack? We've already said, Doing a pre-stack, that's the technical um, solution that you want to do. But there are times when, you know, you may not do that. Look, if you've got two 3Ds that are right next to each other, they've got similar processing, the same um, orientation, you wouldn't bother to do this. But if you're trying to deal with those geometric and um, processing issues, then this is a really good solution. Right. When you're constrained by time, money and access to field data, right? There's a big difference between a two month turnaround for 8,000 square kilometres and a year, right? It makes a big difference. Um, when, um, when you don't have enough money, it's more expensive to do a pre-stack. Um, and sometimes you don't have access to field data, right? Or you have only access to field data on one of your surveys and not the others. So if you don't have that access to field data, then you don't really have any other option. And sometimes, if you're going to do a pre-stack re-migration, then you may also want to do a post-stack at the beginning of that project. So um, we did it for the Barrow Dampier CCS study, which was 35,000 square kilometres. And the estimate is that it sped up that project by five months, right? So just having early access to that volume improved the delivery time by five months. It also improved the model building because you've got those interim horizons that you can use to inform that migration. 
um, and the model building around that and the velocity picking. And also it will highlight those areas where you're going to have problems. So, you know, where you're going to have multiples, where you're going to have velocity inconsistencies that are affecting um, the imaging and where you're going to have problems with noise because these will be different with multiple surveys. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, in particular the team at Doug, Scott and the team. Um, I think you'll agree that, that there's a lot of uplift in that data. Um, it's a lot easier to work with and it's a lot better quality um, and it makes a difference to the interpretation team. Um, thanks Cam for all his work on the project. Uh, I don't know if Cam's here. No. Um, the repository team. So like I said, this was a very fast turnaround and the repository team really did have to crank it um, to get the data ready to ship to the contractor. And um, yeah, they went above and beyond. Um, the reviewers of the AEP publications, Donna and Yvette, thanks Yvette. Um, Chris Evenden for figure production and of course the entire offshore team for doing all the interpretation which we'll see in a minute. Um, but yes, all their input to this, they provided inputs for those windows um, and they've provided a lot of feedback on the value of the data. So we'll take questions right at the end, but I'll hand over to Chris now for the second part of today. Thank you all. Good morning all and um, let me just adjust the camera for those online. I actually can't see the camera view. Ah oh, yes, there it is. I hope that's okay for those online. Um, so I'm going to be giving you uh, an overview of a presentation that we delivered at the AEP conference um, a few weeks ago and it's on new perspectives of the structural uh, architecture across the offshore Otway Basin. It utilises the data set we've heard M talk about, but I'll go into some of the other data that it uses. It's really at a more regional scale. So just to um, step back, uh, M's uh, informed us of where the Otway Basin is. Uh, it's in that southeastern margin of of, of this of the southern margin, um, and it formed during the rifting and breakup of Australia and Antarctica, and it has an Upper Jurassic through to Cenozoic uh, sedimentary succession. And so some context behind why we were interested in doing work in the offshore Otway Basin. Well, GA had previously published an inventory of Australia's offshore basins, identifying all of the data gaps. Um, and in the case of the offshore Otway Basin, it was recognised that the sparse coverage and poor quality of legacy seismic data across the deep water areas was the real limiting factor to understanding uh, the geology of this part of the basin. And so this was able to be addressed, as Em alluded to earlier, by the acquisition of the 2020 seismic program, which saw uh, the acquisition of over 7,000 line kilometres of seismic data across the deep water areas and the reprocessing of around 10,000 line kilometres of existing data from the coastal areas through to the deep water areas. Um, and this increased the coverage in, in the deep water areas from, as M mentioned, uh, over 100 kilometres in some instances down to uh, 5 to 10 kilometres. And so that has, um, that has enabled us to undertake the offshore energy systems team at GA to undertake a regional seismic mapping study across the basin and this provides new insights into the Cretaceous rift related stratigraphic uh, framework and, and the location of the super sequence depot centres, um, the Cretaceous and basement structural architecture as well as crustal thinning trends across the basin. And so these uh, insights have enabled us to make updates to basin boundaries and existing structural elements and also have implications for prospectivity, particularly in the deep water um, areas. Collectively, this pr helps provide a basin-wide perspective on the structural architecture and stratigraphic framework. So the mapping of the regional super sequences um, builds on the existing super sequ uh, sequence frameworks from other workers in various parts of the basins. 
It utilises the um, 18,000 odd line kilometres of new and reprocessed seismic data, in addition to the um, 40,000 line kilometres of existing legacy seismic data. And as we heard from M just now, um, more recently, we're able to integrate um, interpretations from the uh, 2023 Otway 3D post stack mega merge. And that was really helpful for us um, in tying the inboard shallow water interpretations into the deep water part of the basin in, in that region. And all of these super sequences have been tied to um, 18 um, wells across the basin using updated biosonation. So it's giving us confidence in our interpretations. And so in today's presentation, what I'd like to do is um, give a brief overview of the Cretaceous Rift super sequence uh, depicenter evolution before making some comments on our observations of the structural framework um, and then the implications of um, petroleum prospectivity. Before I get into the details of um, the observations of, of the depicenter evolution though, um, because I'll be referring to uh, various structural elements um, throughout the, the talk, I'll just um, do a bit of a basin orientation of some of the key ones that I'll be referring to for those of you who might not be familiar. So we have the Inner Otway Basin, um, and this consists of the onshore component and shallow marine component of um, the Otway Basin, uh, and is made up of a variety of um, platforms and, and troughs, and some of you may have heard of the shipwreck um, trough, um, and as M also mentioned, this is a, a premier um, gas producing province for East, East Coast Australia. We then have the Deepwater Otway Basin, um, and this is comprised of two distinct depot centres. Uh, we have the Nelson Subbasin in the southeast, and we have the Morham Subbasin in the northwest. And so, if we start um, at the uh, in the early Cretaceous, looking at the um, crayfish super sequence depot centre, here we have um, an isocore map or a two-way time thickness map, and in the, the 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 purples and the blues, that's where we have the thickest sedimentation. And, and the, the reds and, and oranges and yellows is the thinnest sedimentation. So what we can see from this crayfish super sequence depot centre, which represents the Jurassic to Beremium first phase of extension, um, it's a fluvio lacustrine succession, and it, it, it represents that initial inboard extension phase. And what we're seeing is that the thickest sediments are located on the platform areas um, whilst the sedimentation thins outboard over the deep water Otway Basin. And it's, it's actually absent in the northwest and southeast over um, a series of basement highs. And that sequence is then overlain by the Umarella um, super sequence, which represents the Aptian to Albion volcanoclastic sag succession following that um, extension. And unsurprisingly, um, the sediments are thickest there overlying those sinrift depot centres where we would expect to see um, maximum thermal sag. And again, thinnest over the deep water parts of the basin and, and thin to absent over those basement highs. If we then step up into the second phase of extension and the deposition of the shipwreck super sequence, here we can see that um, this depot centre is actually thinnest over the platform areas and the deposition has stepped outboard where we have two distinct depot centres um, in, in the deep water part of the basin in both the Morham and Nelson sub-basins. Overlying this, we have the Sherbrook super sequence, which is a continuation of um, that second phase of extension. And again, we have sedimentation being thinnest over those inboard platform areas and thickening outboard um, but this time we see a distinct uh, change in the locus of sedimentation to the northwest in the Morham Subbasin. And if we combine all of these um, together to look at the whole of Cretaceous, um, the depot centre as a whole, so that representation of the Cretaceous uh, rift related deposition, we start to get some ideas on the geometry of the overall uh, rift architecture and we can see that we have maximum thickness um, of up to 5,800 milliseconds two-way time in the Morham sub-basin uh, to the northwest. We have uh, 
uh, thinning of the sedimentation over a series of outer margin structural highs where we have the late Cretaceous sediments on lapping, indicating that they were forming at the same time as the Cretaceous sediments were being deposited. We have a series of perched half graben in the southeast, um, overlying shallow basement, um, defining the, the edge, the eastern edge of, of the basin. And then we have a series of a smaller half graben depot centres stepping up from the Morham sub-basin in the northwest, defining that edge of the basin. But perhaps the most important observation that we can take from being able to visualise for the first time the whole of the Cretaceous um, rift fill is that it's enabled us to make some needed updates to some of the existing basin boundaries and structural elements. Uh, for example, the previous boundary between the Otway and Sorel basins was um, broadly arbitrary in nature, and that was due to the legacy seismic data being very, very um, uh, sparse and of poor quality and not really enabling um, a geologically supported um, boundary, whereas the new data and interpretations allow us to um, uh, create a geologically supported boundary between the Otway and Sorel basins. And that's important because this separates the depositional um, systems of these two basins and has implications for the potential development and distribution and preservation of petroleum system elements such as um, seal and um, and reservoir lithologies, br broadly speaking. If we then look below the Cretaceous Rift Depot Centre at the Paleozoic basement and basement involved faults, we get some other indications of um, structural factors influencing uh, basin architecture. So for example, we know from a 2011 study by Gibson and others um, that was looking into the basement terrains underlying the rifted margins of Australia and Antarctica, that the southeastern corner of the Otway Basin is underlain by a north-northwest oriented basement fabric. And this has had a strong influence on um, the basement involved faults in this part of the basin, where we see these north-northwest orientated faults in the Sorel Fault Zone defining that eastern margin of the basin. Stepping outboard over the Muscle Hin Zone, we see a series of uh, northwest, uh, southeast oriented uh, in echelon crustal uh, scale detachment faults that step down from the platform edge and offset the basement, separating the inboard Otway Basin from the deep water Otway Basin. Looking on to the, the platform areas uh, of the uh, prawn platform, shipwreck trough, mussel platform, the faults, the basement involved faults in this area strike predominantly north-south or northeast-southwest, and correlate with a series of Cretaceous fold axes, uh, indicating the, the basement control on um, basin uh, deformation in this area. And then moving finally to the northwest, we have the prominent um, trumpet uh, fault, which marks the basement-basement boundary in this part of the basin. And it's also accompanied by a series of east-west orientated faults which uh, detach um, and, and offset basement to the south. And as well as um, some of the, the basement um, structural architecture observations we can make, the new data has enabled us to uh, interpret other aspects of crustal architecture across the basin. Um, so for example, uh, it shows a, a deep layered um, zone of um, a, a layered seismic facies, and that represents the uh, lower, laminated continent, uh, lower laminated continental crust. And this is overlain by a seismically transparent um, uh, unit, which represents the, the upper crust. And because of the quality and spacing of the recently acquired data, we're able to map these across um, the basin. And what that shows us is that um, when we look at thickness maps of the lower laminated crust and the combined upper and lower crust is that we're seeing a higher level of crustal thinning um, as we step outboard over the deep water parts of, of the margin. And this happens to also correlate with um, satellite gravity modelling of crustal thinning trends across the southern margin by Nick Kuznir in 2008, which is, which is encouraging for us. Um, and collectively, uh, this helps us delineate uh, proximal necking 
distal and outer structural domains correlating with the varying degrees of crustal thinning trends. <clears throat> and when we compare the crustal thinning trends <clears throat> to the orientation and location of the um, upper crust, uh, the upper Cretaceous depot centres, we can see that there's a, there's a strong correlation indicating that it's likely that the crustal thinning has had quite a strong influence on the location or, and orientation of that upper Creta Cretaceous depot centre. By comparison, if we compare it to the lower Cretaceous Eumorella and crayfish supersequence depot centres, um, they're located over, over thicker crust and, and appear to be less influenced by that, that crustal thinning. However, there is um, still an important question that remains, and that's why is there such a pronounced uh, westerly shift from the shipwreck supersequence depot centre to the overlying Sherbrooke supersequence depot centre? And this seems counterintuitive when we know that the rifting uh, and unzipping of the southern margin was coming from west to east. However, we think there are several factors that could have influenced um, this. Uh, for example, in some previous uh, GA gravity and magnetic modelling, uh, it suggested the uh, significant intrusion and underplating of mafic magma in the lower crust beneath the Nelson subbasin in the southeast. This is also supported by um, more recent uh, depth of magnetic basement, basement modelling using um, some of the new data from the new surveys, which suggests significant intrusives within the Cretaceous sediments themselves. And the new seismic data itself really supports this um, with more abundant intra-Cretaceous volcanism and intrusion um, in the Nelson subbasin compared to the Morham subbasin in the west. And so a result of this magmatic and thermal input in the Nelson subbasin um, at the time could have resulted in more buoyant crust uh, in the east and favour that westerly shift uh, in the late Cretaceous Serbrook supersequence deposition. This may have also influenced uh, the distribution um, of regional gross depositional environments. And so this was another piece of work that I won't go into details about today that the team undertook, and that was to map three intervals of gross depositional environments throughout the late Cretaceous. Um, and we had um, several posters presented at the conference on this and we have a, a series of data packages that will be coming out to support this work. But in a nutshell, what we can see in this map here of the shipwreck super sequence regional gross depositional environments is the fluvial plain environment in yellow, the coaster and delta plain environment in blue, and the marine shelf um, environment in green. And these were interpreted using seismic facies analysis, um, available uh, well log data, and uh, where available also um, logged cores. So that was combined together to produce these maps. And if we scroll up through the late Cretaceous, we can see the progressive basinward migration of those depositional environments. And what we see in the Sherbrooke, uh, in the Morham subbasin to the west, where we have that thick Sherbrooke supersequence deposition, is a band of that coastal and delta plain environment. We can also, when we look at the uh, depositional environments maps against the crustal thinning maps, we can see that broad correlation as well, just highlighting the linkage between crustal thinning, uh, deposition, and then the subsequent distribution of, of the environments being deposited into those depot centres. This also has um, potential implications for petroleum prospectivity because we might expect the late Cretaceous crustal extension to be associated with um, higher heat flow. Um, and this may have had uh, detrimental uh, impacts for more deeply buried shipwreck supersequence source rocks in that deep water part of the basin where we've had the high level of crustal thinning. Um, we've been working, uh, uh, collaborating and doing some petroleum systems modelling and that's indicated that these source rocks were already highly mature. However, uh, the higher heat flow may have had um, positive implications for marine source rocks within the Sherbrooke supersequence depot centre in these deep water parts of the basin, um, overlying the, the highly uh, extended crust. 
And given we have <clears throat> in this deep water part of the basin, we have a wide distribution of the marine shelf depositional environment that might enhance our source rock potential. Um, and this gives rise to thinking about some potential plays within the Sherbrooke um, super sequence itself. Uh, we could have marine source rocks um, with minor delta top sets reservoirs within the, the shelf depositional environment itself. And we could have had coastal and deltaic reservoirs with marine source rocks um, within extensional growth wedges in that inner Morham subbasin where we have that deep, uh, thick Sherbrooke super sequence deposition. So just in conclusion, um, this work has helped to provide some insights into the tectonostratigraphic framework um, and evolution of the deep water Otway Basin. Um, we've been able to map the Cretaceous super sequence depocenters regionally. This has enabled um, geologically supported updates to um, structural elements and basin boundaries. Deep crust or reflectors have been regionally mappable and illustrate that highly extended nature of uh, crust in the deep water areas. And this crustal thinning appears to have controlled or influenced the um, upper Cretaceous super sequence depocenter orientations and locations, as well as the distribution of those regional depositional environments. And this has implications for the petroleum system elements and upper Cretaceous um, source rocks in this part of the basin and opens up scape, scope to go back and, and revisit some of the previous petroleum systems models in this region. It's also worth noting that collectively all, all of these in, inputs can be um, re-engineered and the, and the petroleum systems modelling can be re-engineered um, for uh, CCS or carbon capture and storage prospectivity studies if that was a direction we wanted to go in. So we've got a lot of inputs that we can use for multiple purposes there. So I'd just like to finish up with some, firstly, acknowledgements. I'd like to um, thank Jenny Totterdell and Ollie Schenk for their fruitful discussions and really just thank um, our co-authors and the Offshore Energy Systems team, um, as well as Tom Burnick of Barry Bradshaw and Victor for their, their reviews and Ethan Shaw for his assistance with the drafting. And I'll just uh, finish there's, uh, with a little plug for some uh, upcoming data releases uh, that we, we will be putting out. And I'll leave it there for questions, I believe. Thank you.